evening and welcome to Temple Heights Baptist Church for our Wednesday night service. Um, buenas noches y bienvenidos a nuestro servicio que tenemos los miércoles por la noche en la iglesia de uh, Bautista de Temple Heights. We are going to begin with our theme song for Missions Month, which is We have a story to tell the, to the nation. everybody. I think I'm here by the strength of God alone, right, Miss Chris? Yes. <laughs> so and pray. Antibiotics. And antibiotics. So we had a wonderful, uh, well, this would be two Sundays ago from uh, Gary Smiley. He writes us a letter. Dear Pastor Mass, thank you for allowing me to worship with, with you and uh, give the worldwide Gideon International message on February 11th. It was truly a blessing. I also want to thank you for the generous gift of $175. It will provide 134 Bibles to a lost and dying world. May God continue to richly bless you, and may his face shine upon you in his service for him, Gary Smiley Gideons. For what a wonderful the message is going out. We praise the Lord for that. Let's open in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for allowing us to gather together, Lord, on this Wednesday. Lord, uh, may you be with all that's said, all that's sung, all that's spoken. Lord, the message that you provide. Lord, may you fill uh, Brother Stephen with the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, give me strength. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, and our next song of the night is Faith is the Victory. <laughs> Along the hills of light, ye Christians, soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall bear the glowing skies. Against the bow and bands below, let all our strength behold. Faith is a victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory, faith 
song just sounds so victorious right because we know that God has already won and our last song of the night is the assurance that he gives us (laughs) blessed assurance
right, thank you very much Cedric, for leading us in song. We got the opportunity to talk to the UPS driver. He uh, comes around and waits for uh, his counterpart so they can back up to each other and transfer packages back and forth because we have a safe and large lot. So I got to talk to him, asked uh, if he knew where he was going to heaven and why, and he gave a strong, solid answer that uh, Jesus alone. And so I welcomed our brother. So I asked that he pray for us and then he talked to his counterpart. So I assume he's doing that right now. So pray for that. All right, so we're in the middle of our uh, faith, pro not middle, we're coming to the end. Sad, huh? Oh, sad. Yeah, so sad. But Friday we have our Friday night outreach. So we're on that cycle. And then Saturday we have our Saturday night Bible study, the book of James with uh, Brother White. So coming out for that. And then Sunday we have our Tell the Nations Missions Conference. And we have uh, Brother uh, John Proctor. He is with the Rock of Ages. If you're familiar with the Rock of Ages, they go, their ministry is just to prisons. And specifically, John Proctor's ministry is to the Spanish-speaking inmates. So he wants to get there. And then uh, Mike and Don Sutton will be with us in the evening for Construction for Worldwide Evangelism, which started here in our church. I remember when uh, Brother Kaleo said, all aboard. And so many years ago. So we're so thankful for that ministry. So a lot to look forward to. Don't forget uh, your faith promise commitments. We have four cards turned in, so... There's a lot of people praying out there. And so pray that what the Lord would have you to give. Right? Yeah. All right. And then uh, I think I've talked to most of you about Galcom. Uh, if I haven't and you're interested in going, uh, let me know. I'll add you to the list. All right? All right. Time for Awana. All right. Where is our... Here we go. American flag. All right. Let's stand out front. All right, so everybody stand at attention. American flag first, salute. Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You want a flag? I pledge allegiance to the Iowa flag that stands for the Iowa Club. Bible? I pledge allegiance to the Bible, to my holy word, I will make it a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path, I will hide his words in my heart, so I might not sin the sin against God. Thank you very much, ladies. You can be seated. Our Bible verse for today is Ephesians 6 1. Does any kids know Ephesians 6 1? Yes, what's you know it? Oh. Well, you need to learn it. This is very important, right? You want to say it, Matthew? That's right. Let's all say it together. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Brother? Ephesians 6, 1. Hijos, obedecer en el Señor a vuestros padres, porque esto es justo. Efesios 6, 1. Hijos, obedecer en el Señor a vuestros padres, porque esto es justo. Let's pray. Señor, te damos gracias por la gran oportunidad que tenemos nuevamente de venir aquí entre hermanos para poder estudiar tu palabra. Reconociendo, Señor, que no somos dignos de estar aquí, Señor. Gracias por ese sacrificio único que nos trae vida nueva, nos trae propósito, Señor. Te rogamos que nos use para tu gloria y honra y para que tu iglesia siga floreciendo, Señor. Por amor a tu gran nombre, te rogamos en el nombre de Jesús y te damos gracias nuevamente, Señor. Amén, amén. Thank you, brother. If you want to go to Spanish Bible study, go that way. If you want to go to a wine with the kids, go that way. And those who just don't want to get up, welcome.
you have the last week's handout, we're working off that page, 84 and 85, and then I have 86 and 87. So if you need last week's handout, and if you need, well, you probably all need a new handout. So today we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 22. 1 Samuel 22. Okay, real quick, a quick review. David's on the run. David's on the run, and so when uh, Saul uh, threw the spear at David the second time, he ran uh, to his wife in Gibeah, his, the capital city. From there, where he had to escape, his wife let him out of the window. From there, he fled to Ramah, where uh, Samuel is, and the uh, school of the priests. So <laughs> Samuel is the one who uh, anointed David, so a logical place to run to when, when uh, he's uh, being chased. And uh, Saul got to Ramah, and so David had to flee, and he fled back to Gibeah, where he went to his best friend, Jonathan. And so he had to convince Jonathan that, yes, your dad's trying to kill me. And so they came up with a system to determine what that is true. And unfortunately, it was true that Saul was trying to kill David. So David fled uh, from, from uh, Gibeah, and he went to Nob. What was in Nob? Samuel. Not Samuel. The tabernacle. The tabernacle. So, you know, a good, safe place to go, church, right? So he went there and asked for bread. He uh, told a lot of white lies, uh, which will come up later to hunt David. And then eventually he saw a spy, which will come back to hunt David. And then he uh, asked for a spear. What spear, what special spear was at the tabernacle? Goliath's spear. Goliath's spear. So we've seen a downward track for David in his trust. Remember when he fought Goliath, he did not need a spear. But now that he's running, he thinks he needs a spear to protect himself. And he's running. And so he leaves the tabernacle, and he goes to Gath. What's special about Gath? That's where Goliath from. That's the enemy of the Philistines, right? So he's gone. Basically, let's say he, he, he didn't find security in church, so he went to find security in a bar. Let's just put those equivalents together, right? So he went to a place that was the enemy, hoping to find refuge there. And what did he find? They recognized him, right? And then they imprisoned him. And so that's when David turned back to the Lord. And the Lord gave him a, a plan to escape. And what was that unique plan? To be a madman, to be crazy. Because what king wants to have a crazy man in his, in his city? You know, maybe the gods are upset. And so we got to get this guy who's bad luck out of here. And so he was a madman. And so that's where we left off last week. All right, so 1 Samuel 22, uh, starting in verse 1. David therefore departed thence, so he departed from Gath, and escaped to the cave of Abdullah, or Ab Adalam, Adalam. And when his brother and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. So Adalam uh, just means refuge. We're not quite sure where this place is. So this was David's place of refuge. He couldn't go to his house. He didn't go to the palace. He didn't go to Samuel. He couldn't go to Jonathan. He couldn't go to the house of the Lord, and he couldn't go to the ungodly. But he could go to a humble cave and find refuge. Those times when we find that sweet, dark moment in a way where God alone can talk to us. And this is where we're going to find David. Most archaeologists believe that the cave of Adullam was not too far from the place where David de defeated Goliath in the hills of Judah. David couldn't help but to consider how far he had come from a great victory to running around like a criminal hiding in a cave. Right? David has killed his, Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his ten thousands. Now he's on the run and he's hiding in a cave. So this is where we find David. 
What do, what do we see here in verse 1? He departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. What happened? Who showed up? His brethren, his family came. His family came. Why would his family come? To support him? Well, what about King Saul? You're trying to find David? Now the target is on the family as well as David, right? So they're on the run. And so they find the best places to go be with David. So his whole, whole brethren. And do you remember the last time his brethren... And David were involved together. They were making fun of David. What can you be doing? You, you go back to uh, the sheep. You can't be going out there fighting Goliath. What are you thinking? And so <coughs> that's the last time we saw of David's brother. And now they're coming to him uh, for safety and refuge. And so this is quite, quite fascinating here. So his family came to him as they were in danger of being killed by King Saul as well. Verse 2, and there were one, and everyone that was in distress, and everyone was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. So not only does his family show up at the caves, he's on the run trying to find refuge. His family shows up, and all of a sudden now all these people show up. And what type of people are showing up? Discontent, distressed, in debt, right? People with problems. Are those the people you want? So what do we have here? God called an unlikely and unique group to David in this cave of Adam. They were not the men David would probably have chosen for himself. But they were the ones God called to him. These men recognized, rec recognized his leadership and this number, this army, that all of a sudden showed up, kept growing. These are the kind of men who came to David distressed, bankrupt, dissatisfied. These are the kind of men who came, who come to Christ. And they're the only people who come to him. For they have recognized their distress, their debt and bankruptcy. And are conscious that they are utterly discontented. The sheer pressure of these frustrations drive them to refuge of the blood of Christ that was shed for them. All of us here are one of these three. Maybe we uh, recognize when the Lord approached us, we recognize we have no hope. We're in debt. We can't get rid of our sin. And so we go find refuge in Jesus. Maybe we were discontented with life. We were at the bottom of the barrel. And all we could do is look up. These are the people that come to Christ. Maybe distressed and oppressed. I have no hope. I have enemies all around me. But I find refuge in Jesus. What a wonderful picture of David being a foreshadow of Christ and calling these men to himself to be a refuge. David has followers, and so does the son of David, Jesus Christ. Do you see the truth of which this Old Testament story is a graphic picture? Just in David's day, there was a king in exile who was gathering around him a company of people who are in distress, right? The king of kings is not on the throne here on earth, is he? He's on the throne in heaven, right? We know during the millennial kingdom, he will have his throne here on earth. And so he's in exile, gathering around him believers who are in distress and debt discontented. He's training and preparing them for the day when he shall come again to reign. So these men are being trained for when David will be reigning. You know, the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes are the attitude we should have when we approach Christ. All right, that's what it means, Beatitudes. So this is the attitude we must have. So Matthew 5, 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, those are in debt. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We recognize we have nothing. We are poor. We're in debt. We're in a hopeless state. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We mourn because we see the sin we have and how it distresses our Lord, how it makes our Lord upset. 
we mourn over our sin we've done to our Savior. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, we, don't rec we can't recognize we can do it ourselves. I can't do it, Lord. You have to do it. I come to you. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Do you hunger for the Lord, things of the Lord? Those are the ones who are going to Christ. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. That's what these men were dealing with. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. So we see this through these men. We're coming to find refuge in David, who himself is also on the run. I mean, that doesn't make much sense, does it? Go to someone who can't quite help you because you're all, they're also on the run themselves. But they gathered together. God brought them together. God brought them together. David's feelings are described in Psalm 57 and 142. So Psalm 57. To the chief musician, Altasis Mitchum of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. So he fled from Saul to the cave. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. <coughs> For my soul trusted in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. Notice where David is. He's in a cave. This is what he's saying in the cave. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire even the sons of men, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp, sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. That sounds like a song, doesn't it? Let thy glory be above all the earth. They prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me, in the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory, awake, psalter and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto them among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. This had to be one of the best times for singing around that campfire, giving glory to God in that cave, singing praises to the Lord, and yet they're on the run and really have nothing, and yet they're giving glory to the Lord. Psalm 142.1, Meshul of David, a prayer when he was in the cave, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him, I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto the Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, and I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. So Psalm 57 and 142, written in the cave of Adlam. So he's gathered, or he didn't really gather, right? God brought these distressed and indebted people, 400 of them as they're counting, and he becomes captain of an army. And so what happens next? So next, he's going to go to Moab. So verse 3. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab. Moab is a totally different country. 
right? Moab is a totally different country. Let my father, oh, see. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. So David's recognizing, I need to protect my parents. And so he goes to Moab. Why would he go to Moab? Why would he go to a foreign country? No, Saul's influence is not there. That would be true. Yes, the bloodline is through Moab. Who of his relatives came from Moab? Ruth. Yes, Ruth. Jerry, what happened? <laughs> uh, well, David's a so David uh, had Moab blood that went through his great grandmother, Ruth. So there wasn't too much distance removed from the king of Moab to now David. And so we can see here in this verse, there was kind of a, you know, it wasn't a, uh, there wasn't friction. It was kind of a welcoming, we'll do this for you, we'll take care of your parents. And David here is looking after his parents, and, you know, that's what we need to be doing, looking after our parents. So Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, says, Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez begat Haran, Hezron. And Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Amminadab, and Amminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz, right? Ruth married Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Verse 4 of chapter 1 of Ruth. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. So David used his relationship with Moab, the king of Moab, to protect his parents. So this is for safekeeping from King Saul. David's kind of getting courage of himself, right? He's not going to run. He's going to return back. He's not going to hide out in Moab forever. But he's uh, looking after his parents. So David knew he was the anointed king, but at this point, he just had to trust in God for the next steps. Notice there in that verse what he says. I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. You know, sometimes we don't know exactly what God's going to do for us. We kind of know that God has something big planned for us, but it's not right now. And David had to trust, take one step at a time. At this point in time, the, the word is his lamp, and that lamp is not going very far. It's not reaching out very far. And he took his first priority to protect his parents. But he realized, until God tells me the next steps, I don't know where to go. I'm going to protect my parents until God tells me to move. And sometimes we need to stop and, Lord, you tell me when I need to move. I'm listening to you. I don't know what you have planned, but I'm listening to you. We don't know what our days hold, but we trust in the Lord. First Samuel 22, 4. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with them all the while that David was in the hold. So David stayed in Moab for, for a period of time with his parents. In verse 5. In verse 5, and the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart, and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came to the forest for rest. So David got a message. Who did he get a message from? Gad, the prophet Gad. So when David becomes king, there's going to be two prophets in David's life at that time, his contemporaries. And that's going to be Gad and Nathan. Gad and Nathan. So we're introduced to Gad for the first time. He's already advising David, God has already given Gad a message to give to David. So God provided David a message through the prophet Gad on what to do next. And it was, it's time to stop living here in Moab. It's time to go back to Judah, to the land of Judah. Now, what did David do? Did he argue? My parents, I need to protect my parents. Okay, well, your parents are protected. I need to move on. And so here we have, and he obeyed. 
Gad, by the way, means troop. And uh, there's a, one of the 12 tribes is named Gad. So Gad and Nathan, as we go through First and Second Samuel, we'll see Gad and Nathan come up. For instance, First Second Samuel 24, 11. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer. So David's advisor, David's prophet, the one he sought counsel from. First Chronicles 29, 29. Now the acts of David, the king, first and last, well, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, and in the book of Nathan, the prophet, and the book of Gad, the seer. Second Chronicles 29, 25. And when he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalteries, with harps, according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. David is to go to the land of Judah. Gad told him, get up, leave. David is to leave his own protection and go back into King Saul's domain, back into the midst of danger. We've got time for peace and recovery. It's time to go back into the middle of it all. So David, where does David go? Goes to the forest of Hereth. Does anybody know what Hereth means? It just means forest. We don't know where this is. So a forest in a particular area. Uh, so I don't know, translated forest, forest. But that's what Hereth means, forest. It's not known where the forest is that David went to. Probably a good thing, right? Otherwise, King Saul would know. So David's been on the move. He's heading out in the cave. He's taking his parents, an army, to Moab. An army has, 400 has developed. And now he's back into the land of Judah. So what do you think happening with Saul? What is Saul feeling right now? He's insecure, doesn't he? Clearly insecure. You know, he's going to get word back of what's happening. These things are not secret. Someone's talking, and he's going to get word back. So verse 6. When Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gibeah, that's the capital city right now, under a tree in Brahma, having his spear in his hand. So kind of like a scepter, using his spear as a scepter. And all his servants were standing about him. So he's getting word what's happening to David. So King Saul's hearing that David is back in Israel with 400 men. And so David, or King Saul starts questioning his advisors, his servants, his counselors all around him. Verse 7, then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? And make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds. What is Saul saying here? Who are the Benjaminites? Huh? Yes. Right, King Saul is a Benjaminite. So if you read this verse, right? Um, here now, you Benjamites. So who are his advisors? His yeah, his, his, his tribe, his tribe. Now, has anything happened differently today? Someone gets into elected position, and they put in positions of, uh, you know, the cabinet and advisors and ambassadors. Who is that person going to choose? Trusted men, right? But what else? Family, people who supported you, gave a lot of money to you, right? These are those people. But we see here ben uh, Saul's advisors or Benjamites. That's one tribe out of 12. I think King Saul's losing some diversity from, from the rest of the tribe, right? He's not getting counsel from everyone. He's only getting counsel from the Benjamites. So what is King Saul telling him, telling his advisors? You're conspiring against me, right? How come this is happening? Would David give you leadership ability, vineyards, properties, would David do that? No, look what I've done for you. I've given you these wonderful fields and vineyards. David's not going to do that for you, but I will. I've done that for you. I've made you captain of thousands, captain of hundreds. I've done that for you. So King Saul, what is he doing? Using his position as king to benefit his tribe. 
to benefit the Benjaminites. And now King Saul is going to accuse his servants. How quickly the tide turns on your advisors, right? Verse 8. Do you feel like you're in the Oval Office? Verse 8. Did all of you have conspired against me? And there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. Well, who's this? Who's his son? Jonathan. Who's the son of Jeff Jesse? David. No one's told me that David and Jonathan have made a league together. David and Jonathan are, are friends together. David, the Jonathan is protecting David. No one has told me this. You've kept this a secret from me. You've conspired against me. And there is none of you that is sorry for me. Well, King Saul seems to be in a state of self-pity, doesn't he? You're not even doing anything for me. He's become paranoid of his own son. And there's none of you that is sorry for me or showeth unto me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. David, uh, Saul is very upset, upset with his advisors, upset with his son, upset with the position that he finds himself in. He's paranoid. He's paranoid. So imagine this. He's got all his counselors on him, and he's berating them. He's berating them. Verse 9. Then answered Doag the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Moab, to Elimelech, the son of Etub. So here we introduce to Doag again. Where did we last see Doag? The tabernacle, right, at Nob, right? We have this one verse that mentioned that Doag was there. Not too much else is talked about Doag. So no doubt, now Doag comes into play. So as King Saul is berating his counselors, Doag comes in and interrupts King Saul and says, you know what? I saw David at Nob. I saw David with Elimelech, the high priest. I saw him there. So Doag reveals that David went to Noab, where he met with Elimelech. Verse 10. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him victuals. He gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. So Doag tells Saul all that had happened. In fact, it looks like he expounded a little bit more. Because first off, we say he inquired of the Lord for him. Well, we don't see that in the passage earlier. So David's, or Doag's trying to create a case against Elimelech, against the priest of Nob. Now, it could likely that, that uh, Elimelech asked the Lord, uh, asked the Lord for David some questions, but that wasn't revealed earlier. So what happens when a high priest inquires of the Lord? So if you remember the high priest, vest, breastplate, has 12 stones on it, right? Representing each of the 12 tribes. Well, within that, within that uh, breastplate are two stones. One that says umum and one that says thurnum. Basically, yes or no. And so a question is asked, and the high priest pulls it out, and there's your answer. So this is what Doag is inferring. Whether it happened or not, it's not stated earlier. Doag's a liar. He's a thief. He's a spy. Right? He's making a case, trying to take some of the shift some of the blame or some of the pressure off the counselors, right, and kind of give Saul uh, something he can take action on. Verse 7, then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, here now ye Benjaminites, will the son of Jesse give, well, I already do that one. Verse 9, let's go to verse 9. This is where Doag says that Jesse came, the son of Jesse came to Noab, Nob. Verse 10, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave victuals and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. So again, looks like he's making the sword just a little bit bigger than it was. So verse 11, so Saul gets this information, finds out that uh, even his high priest and the other priests seem to be in conspiracy against King Saul. What do you think King Saul's going to do? Huh? Kill him. Right, look how low we've gotten. Right, we're going to kill the priest of the Lord. Wow. King Saul is taking another step. Verse 11. 
1 Samuel 22, 11 says, Then the king sent, un, call, sent to call Elimelech the priest, the son of Etob, and his father's house, the priests that were at Nob, and they came, all of them, to the king. So King Saul summoned Elimelech and the priests to him. King Saul didn't go to the tabernacle, didn't go to Nob. He summoned them to come to him. Did Elimelech uh, come? Yes, he came. They obeyed and came to the king. And this would be all the members of the house of Eli. Verse 12. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son Etab. And he answered, Here I, here I am, my lord. So it was still very respectful, right? Very respectful to the king. Then the king sent to call them, like the priests, the son of Etub, his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they came all to the king. Verse 12, and Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Etub. And he answered, Here am I, my lord. And, he said, and Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, in that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him? They should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day. So here he accuses of Elimelech of conspiring against Saul. And so he puts Elimelech in the same position as David. David is a conspirator. Elimelech and the priests are now conspirators. If Saul's accusation is true, then God, then Saul is going against God. Right? Elimelech is a representation for the Lord. And Saul is going against the Lord. Verse 14. Then Elimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable to thine house? All right, so Elimelech is being accused of treason. How does Elimelech respond? You're, David is your best. He's your most faithful. He does all your bidding. He's the most honorable in all your house. Isn't this great that Elimelech is standing up for David? Because that's what the truth is. Elimelech's not trying to find a, a scapegoat or a way out. It's like, I'm very uncomfortable being in King Saul, and my neck potentially is on the line here. Elimelech spoke for David. Said how wonderful David has been, how faithful David has been to Saul. So he was defending David. is not afraid to say, that David is Saul's most faithful servant. Verse 15. Did I then begin began to inquire of a God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto thy ser his servant, nor to all the house of thy father. For thy servants knew nothing of all this, less or more. So what is Elimelech stating? I didn't know that David was on the run. I didn't know David was an outlaw. I didn't know you were trying to arrest David. That bulletin didn't come to me. I just did what I was supposed to do. But I didn't know about this. You're making accusations to me about something I was not aware of. Don't accuse us of something we're not aware of. So Elimelech states that he was not aware that David was an outlaw. Verse 16, and David said, Thou shalt surely die. Elimelech, thou and all thy father's house. Wow, he doesn't waste any time. Off with your heads. Off with your heads. This is the high priest. The king is going to kill the high priest and all the priests right there. Verse 17. And the king said unto footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, because they knew when he fled. I did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. Now the footmen described here, they're literally the official executioners for the king. That was their job, to execute. It wasn't to let me take my secretary of state and my secretary of defense and you guys go kill them. No, these were official executioners. So what did they do? Refused. Refuse. The judgment doesn't fit the crime. We don't see the crime. 
We don't see it. This is unjust punishment. Unjust punishment. They knew this order was unjust and that this would be against God's law. These men did not. Yes. You want me to have the priest's blood on my hands. That's what you're saying, King Saul. They have nothing to do with this. This is unjust. We are not going to go against the Lord's anointed. We're not going to go against the Lord's anointed. Now, can you guess who will ultimately kill them? They need a mic. Yes. Verse 18. And the king said to Doag, turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doag the Enamite turned, and he fell upon the priests, and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. So four score and five persons, what number is that? Eighty-five priests. Eighty-five priests. Ephod. Those are the priests. So you have the, the priestly gun. In other words, this does say these are priests. These are the ones going into the tabernacle. These are the ones that are serving the menorah on this table of showbread. These are the ones that are taking care of the sacrifices, the offerings, yes. And here they're killed. They're all killed. So Doag, the Edomite, he has no qualms. He went ahead and slaughtered 85 priests. Is Doeg done? No. He's not done. Verse 19. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, in other words, babies, infants, and ox and donkeys and sheep with the edge of the sword. So remember, this is happening at Gibeah, where 85 are killed, the 85 priests are killed. Not only does he stop, does it stop there, he goes and kills all the families and the livestock at Nob. This is a low upon lows, right? Now, interestingly, remember the story where uh, Saul was commanded to go kill all the Amalekites and all the livestock, right? And Samuel comes in and says, I hear bleating of a sheep. Yet here, he has everyone killed. Quite drastic difference, huh? So a couple observations about the execution of the priests. Number one, David had lied to Elimelech and endangered the, the priesthood. David had lied, remember? David was not totally truthful when he came to see Elimelech. He did come to Elimelech and says, I'm on the run, please protect me. King Saul's trying to kill me. It was nothing like that. It was a, he told Elimelech, I'm on a secret mission for the king. So David lied. Secondly, we see Saul's vengeance. He was paranoid. He wanted to take action. He wanted to get rid of anybody who was against him. And thirdly, we see that this is ultimately a fulfillment of the judgment of God on the house of Eli. Remember we talked about Eli when he fell over and broke his neck? There was a lot of uh, prophecies relating to his family and that his family line would stop and would not continue. Well, this is a big majority of that prophecy that's now come true. So God is sovereign. He knows all things. And this was going to happen, right? The fulfillment of God's judgment on the house of Eli. Psalm 52 talks about Doag and the killing of the priests. To the musician Meskil, a psalm of David, when Doag the Edomite came and told Saul and said unto him, David has come to the house of Lamelech. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. David addresses Doag directly, O mighty man. He rebukes him for boasting of his evil deeds. Look what I've done. I've killed all 85 of the Lord's priests. Is that something to boast about? No. No, but yet that's what Doeg's doing. Verse 2, the, thy tongue devises mischiefs like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Talking about Doeg. Thou lovest all devouring words. O thou deceitful tongue. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of his troubles. 
The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. We use this verse around Thanksgiving, don't we? O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is after 85 priests were slaughtered. This is after the city of Nob was slaughtered. And yet this is what David's saying. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. There's nothing you need. God will provide it all. Oh, fear the Lord, ye, ye saints. Oh, it's verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer, hunger, and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. They don't need. God has provided. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David's come through it all. Right now, the, the poor and destitute that are coming to him, he gets to teach them. The Lord is good. Lord is I've seen it. What man is he that desires life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil, thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. He's advising those that are with him. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. To cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Is against those who are wanting to cut off the remembrance, cut off the remembrance of the priests. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. For any other affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of all. He keepeth all his bones, none of them is broken. Who is David talking about there? The Lord, right? The Lord, none of his bones were broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of thy servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. So we have here the priests at Nahab are slaughtered. Very low point. It's a very low point. Do we have any questions or comments? We're going to find out next week that there is a survivor. A lone survivor, and that he's going to run to David, and David's now going to protect him. The king is responsible for protecting the priests. The king has failed. David is now taking that role of protecting the priests. It's not his duty yet, but King Saul has turned against the priests. And so we'll talk about the man named Abathar next week. Questions, comments? Well, let's go in prayer. Dear Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your blessings. Lord, life is hard. Lord, sometimes you have us in a cave. But Lord, thank you for providing for our needs, for showing us your grace and goodness, showing us a place where all we can see to is see you, where all we can see that you're the only one who can provide. Lord, we know there's evil out there. Lord, may you protect us from that evil. In Jesus' name, amen.